but today we have uh, Dr. Josh Goodman, and he's going to be talking about uh, victory on the menu dining out during World War II. And just a reminder, today's presentation is streaming on Facebook Live and will be available for viewing on the museum's Facebook um, after the show. So feel free to share once you get home. And anyone on Facebook, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to uh, take those. So Josh? All right. All right. How's everybody doing today? Okay. I hope that our, uh, our projector here makes it out, uh, makes it through the entire presentation in one piece. I think we've been through five different colors uh, so far just since we've gotten here. Uh, again, my name is Josh Goodman. I'm the teacher programs and curriculum coordinator here at the National World War II Museum. We do a lot of great professional development programs for teachers, not just here in the city of New Orleans. We do a lot here in the New Orleans metropolitan area, but we also do a lot for teachers all over the United States. Professional development programs, distance learning, lots of great projects. Uh, certainly our website, nationalww2museum.org, lots of great information on what we're doing for teachers and students all over the United States. So right now in, in the museum's calendar, so to speak, is a great time to be thinking about things that are happening on the home front uh, during World War II. Arsenal of Democracy uh, getting started upstairs. Uh, how many folks have been to see Arsenal of Democracy so far? Okay, if you haven't yet, then definitely do get a look upstairs. It's a great look at what's going on on the home front, in uh, industrial production, and how families are changed by the war, training, uh, all kinds of interesting issues uh, that are taking place right on the home front. But I like, because this is a lunchbox lecture, and so the first thing that I thought about when it was time to do something like this is, well, let's think about food. And as a historian, I love talking about food with students. Uh, because it's something that's very relatable. We all have to eat. I see a few folks out in the crowd who are eating right now. So this is something that we share in common uh, with folks uh, all, throughout, uh, all throughout history. And certainly it's something that's very important to us here in the city of New Orleans. Uh, we wouldn't be what we are without food. Uh, and so I think it's a great way to make history more relatable. You can learn a lot about what people are experiencing at any particular moment in history based on their food ways, what they're eating, how they prepare it, where they get the food, and all of that. So I thought that that would be just a great little bite to take uh, in home front history uh, for today's program. And of course, the, the, uh, one of the most ubiquitous food-related issues in World War II is, of course, rationing. Uh, this idea, you know, the United States is faced with a tremendous challenge during the course of World War II. Uh, they have to feed not only the home front population, but they've also got to feed a very large military uh, that's overseas in multiple theaters. We've got folks in the Pacific, folks in Europe, folks all over the place, and we've also got to be uh, feeding allies. We're sending a lot of food uh, to the allies at this time, to Britain, to the Soviet Union, and there's a tremendous demand for foodstuffs of all kinds, for grains, for canned foods. Uh, for whatever we can get in terms of vegetables and dairy products and meat and just all this stuff. And in order to do that, uh, the government uh, over the course of World War II does a number of things to make sure that that food supply is as good as possible. And uh, there's, a, there's a couple of aspects of that that I think are particularly interesting to bring up. Food is treated almost like a weapon. Uh, in the course of the United States government's information campaign trying to shape Americans' behaviors uh, for how to be the best possible citizen for the war, you see a lot of posters like the ones up here where food is treated like a weapon. And, well, this one's pretty literal. Food is a weapon. Don't waste it. Buy wisely, cook carefully, and eat it all. Uh, more so than even during World War I, more so than any other time in American history, the United States government gets involved in, I mean, it gets all the way into people's kitchens, actually laying out for citizens what a good citizen should be eating, when they should be eating, how they should be cooking their food, where their food should come from, how much they should be purchasing, how much they should be consuming. I mean, this is an incredibly invasive sort of uh, way of regulating the food supply and food consumption in the course of the country. But it is a reality for virtually every American family during the course of the war. We also see a lot of posters like this uh, where the consumption of food, the production of food in certain ways is linked with patriotism. 
So if you're going to be a good patriot, if you're going to be a good American, then you're going to be the kind of person who grows a few vegetables, even if you're in the city, grow them in a window box or something like that. If you're living out in the country, get yourself a victory garden. You know, uh, waste as little as possible. All of these different things. So food is linked to patriotism, and it's even considered to be a weapon during the course of this. A very interesting way of thinking about food. Now, when we think about rationing, we tend to think about rationing as something that happens to families, right? You get those ration books. We've, we've all seen those ration books that have the little stamps inside uh, that you would turn in at your grocer along with your money uh, to purchase goods there that were rationed. Things like meat and butter and cheese and canned fish and canned meat and uh, things like that. And we think of this as something that happens to families. And that, of course, is a, a big part of the rationing program. This, of course, is on Gravier Street. This is the, uh, the War Rationing Board. Uh, some of you may recognize some of, uh, some of this in here. This is on Gravier Street, which was where the Office of Price Administration and the War Rationing Board for New Orleans was located. It's in the 500 block of Gravier Street there. But as I was thinking about this, I, I, I got to thinking, you know, have you ever been to Sam's? You've been to Sam's or Costco? Uh, or, or if you've ever been into the uh, pantry of one of your favorite restaurants, if you've had the opportunity to get back there, all of the food containers, all of the cans and all of the jars of things, they're so much bigger, right? Because they're not just having to serve a family of three or four or five people. Restaurants are having to serve hundreds, dozens or hundreds of people in the course of a day sometimes, especially things like cafeterias where they're processing many, many, many people during the course of a couple of lunch hours in the middle of the day. And so the question that developed in my mind is, all right, well, if families are being held to such a strict standard with rationing, well, what's happening with restaurants, these really, really big users of food? Uh, so I posed that question. And the truth be told is restaurants were actually rationed just like families. Uh, starting in 1943, and there's a whole process in how they get to the process of, of uh, uh, rationing restaurants. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Uh, but a lot of restaurants, they didn't just disappear uh, as a result of World War II coming into play. Uh, but they did have to significantly alter the way that they served their customers, what they could serve their customers, how much they could serve their customers, all of that. Uh, changes as a result of the rationing program that's placed on restaurants, which as a result has a dramatic effect on the dining experience. So anybody who's going to a restaurant is obviously going to have their experience changed. It's not like you could do today where you can go into the, uh, the Cheesecake Factory or go into Arnaud's or go into wherever you want to go uh, in, in uh, New Orleans or Metairie or wherever and just order whatever you like off the menu. There's a tremendous change as a result of this. Now, Restaurants dealing with the rationing program is actually a real challenge. You might think, you know, we tend to think, I, I hear a lot of times when, we, when re, uh, restaurant eating comes up in the news or something, when they're giving statistics about uh, folks eating out, we think that we're eating out so much more today uh, than we ever had before. And that is true to some extent. There's, it's a generational thing, I think, in a lot of ways. We eat out a lot these days as Americans. But in reality, uh, even though it might seem like during World War II, one of the easiest ways to conserve food would be to eat at home more and not eat out, where the meals are bigger and the portions are bigger. You might think it, it, that everybody would just by nature eat at home more. But in fact, it's actually the opposite. During the course of World War II, Americans were eating out at restaurants at a much higher rate than they had in the previous decade. Uh, just a couple of quick statistics on that. In May 1944, the National Restaurant Association estimated that 30 million people per day were eating at least one meal in a restaurant. 30 million people per day. To get that a little bit more local, in 1945, the Louisiana Restaurant Association did a study. And in one single day, Restaurants in the city of New Orleans, just in the city of New Orleans, served 267,000 meals. Restaurants in the city of New Orleans, one day, 
and I think it's April of 1945, served 267,000 meals. Now, just to put that in perspective, that's slightly less than 50% of the population at that time, which is roughly 600,000. 267,000 meals in one day. So why are people eating out so much at a time when food supplies are so scarce and we're focusing so hard on making sure that the boys overseas uh, and, and our allies and everybody around the country has enough to eat. A couple of things. First of all, unlike the previous decade, uh, Americans at this time have a lot more disposable income. As a result of wartime industries, there's a lot more uh, employment at this time, certainly in the bigger industrialized areas like New Orleans, up the eastern seaboard, places like that. Uh, so more disposable income. Also, there's some changes in the family structure. You know, the typical family unit at this time, uh, if you're looking at a nuclear family, you've got mom, dad, and a few kids. Uh, you know, maybe one or other relative living in the home if you've, if you've got some other relatives living with you. Uh, the war disrupts a lot of this. Sometimes dad is overseas serving in the military or perhaps serving in a war-related industry, in, sometimes even in another city. Uh, mom may also be working in a wartime industry. Uh, that's, that's a big thing at this time. Um, so, a lot of times, the folks who traditionally are purchasing food, preparing food, cooking it, serving it, a lot of times those folks are missing from the home for extended periods during the course of the day. It makes it a lot harder for you to get home and actually create that meal for the family and put it on the table. In addition to that, you've got a tremendous number of people who are dislocated by the war because they're moving to other cities to get war-related jobs. These industrial jobs that, that come into play as a result of World War II, they pay a lot of money compared to what a lot of people were making during the Great Depression. So you get this big influx of people moving away from their homes and moving into bigger cities. And because of that, uh, you know, they're, they're not in their homes. Sometimes they're living alone. Sometimes uh, you've got a couple and both of them are working in the course of the day. All this adds up to the fact that it's tremendously inconvenient for many Americans in the 1940s to be making the same kind of home-cooked meals that we sort of expect when we look at this time period, especially in the 50s where there's all these magazine advertisements showing this very nicely laid out meal every day uh, for the family. So, um, and then just a couple of other things. One, one other thing that's also driving this trend is that whereas families are having to use ration points to purchase many of their meals, if you go to a restaurant, you don't have to use ration points because the restaurant is, they're, they're the entity that's being, uh, that's being charged ration points for the food there. We're going to talk a little bit about how that happens. But so you've got all of these factors sort of feeding into this trend of many, many, many Americans eating meals out even people who would, have, uh, who would not have eaten in a restaurant that often in the past. Okay, so oh, and uh, one, one other thing I should mention at this point is that uh, another, uh, another thing that makes this so challenging for restaurants, not only are they being rationed, and not only is the number of customers going up, but in addition to that, you've still got a tremendous number of shortages of strategic foods. Even if a restaurant had the necessary money, and the necessary points to purchase the foods that they needed to put out uh, what they had on their menu, that doesn't necessarily mean that the wholesaler that they were buying food from would have enough food to fulfill their orders. Okay, so that also is a big challenge, as we're going to see when we get into some menus. Uh, when we get into some menus here. So you've got a lot of challenges for restaurants just to stay open during the course of the war. So how did this work? Um, again, the rationing program for restaurants uh, starts in um, 1943. Uh, a couple of things. They're rationed on pretty much the same items uh, that families are rationed on. There are a few differences, but it's usually a difference of degree, not the difference of type. So they're rationed on things like meat, butter, canned milk, canned fish, um, canned meats, tuna, and, and uh, canned beef and things like that. There's a whole chart of uh, how many points that different cuts of meat would get. The higher the quality of meat, of course, the more points it's going to cost you to get it. So in December of 1942, the Office of Price Administration, that's the same organization that developed the rationing system for families, uh, they took a survey of how many customers restaurants served uh, during December of 1942. And they used that number of customers to determine how many points 
a restaurant would get during the rationing program. And that point number fluctuated depending on where in the United States you were. Okay, so some restaurants were getting X number of, of points per customer that they served in December 1942. Some of them would get more and less, more or less, depending on uh, what food supplies were like in their area. Now, a restaurant could apply to change this number. Okay, so even if, let's say that they had a very bad December uh, and they just they really felt like the, uh, the amount of points that they were getting based on that December 1942 service numbers, if they felt that was really bad, they could apply to the local war rationing board, uh, to the local OPA office to get an increase uh, in their number of points. But they did have to apply for it. It was not automatic. They had to prove that they were serving more customers, significantly more customers than they had been in December 1942. In addition to that, the Office of Price Administration also froze restaurant prices in 10 key defense areas uh, around the United States. And the reason for that was to combat inflation. When supply gets scarce, of course, prices go up because people know, uh, you know, restaurateurs and other business owners, they know that these goods are in demand uh, and it's also more difficult to get them. So, of course, their prices are going up. And so, a lot of times, unregulated, these businesses will raise prices. We're seeing that right now with gasoline, of course. Supplies are slightly decreased because of the hurricanes that we've seen, and so the prices are going up at the pump. Same thing was going on at this time, but the OPA tried to get ahead of that by putting price ceilings on what uh, restaurants could charge. And so, this is an example of one of those price ceiling charts uh, look like. Has anybody ever seen one of these in the city of New Orleans? There is one hanging in public where you can see it. It's actually this one right here. That's our knots. That's our knots down in the French Quarter. They still to this day have it. And you can tell that it's our knots. Look over here. Crepes is at our knot. Seafood lunch. Egg St. Denise. Very New Orleans menu. There probably weren't too many OPA price ceiling lists around the country that looked quite like this. So what would happen is uh, starting in April of 1943, the OPA required each restaurant in these areas where the price ceilings were in effect, uh, they required each restaurant to make out a list like this and turn a copy into the OPA, the Local War Rationing Board, uh, putting in the highest price that was charged during a specific week. It was April 4th through 10th, 1943. You had to put in the highest price uh, that you charge for a list of food items. And they gave out a list of food items. Sometimes it would be menu items. Sometimes it would just be something like the number of eggs, you know, that you charge with breakfast or something like that. And you could not charge anything above that price ceiling. Okay? Anybody, any, any citizen had the right to turn a restaurant in for charging a price that was above this price ceiling. Okay? And that was the OPA's way of preventing inflation from setting in with such shortages uh, as, as there were, and greater demand, of course, as there was during the course of World War II. And then the OPA would send price checkers around, price checker volunteers, to make sure that the price list was posted. Uh, if, you didn't, if you didn't have it on a, a hanging up on the wall like this, you could also put it in the menu. So, for example, this is from the Hotel Astor in New York City. And you can see down here it says that all prices are ceiling prices or below by OPA regulation. Uh, all the ceilings are based on the highest price from April 4th through 10th, 1943. And then you could also request uh, a, a menu uh, or the price list out there for the inspection. Okay? Uh, so volunteer price checkers would also go around and do that. In addition to that, they would check with customers, sometimes speak with customers to make sure that they weren't being overcharged. Uh, and at one time, to give you an idea of just how many people were involved in this, at one point, the local OPA organization, the local district of the OPA, had over a thousand, over a thousand volunteer price checkers just in the city of New Orleans alone. Just in the city of New Orleans alone. Now, they were also going out to some outgoing communities in the New Orleans district. The New Orleans district had about ten parishes in it at the time, uh, but about a thousand price checkers that were based right here out of New Orleans. So this was a considerable uh, undertaking that the federal government did to make sure that restaurants were not overcharging customers. So what could a restaurant do? Obviously restaurants are going to have to get a little bit creative to deal with this. Uh, so there's a few things that they do. First of all, portion control. 
This is something that we, uh, we try to do in our own lives sometimes. Uh, but in this case, it was more mandatory because restaurants could either control the portions that they were putting out or they would not have enough food to serve all their customers. So you start getting a lot of notices like this. This is the Essex and Sussex uh, in New Jersey. And you can see here they're saying wartime restrictions limit the service of food to items which are listed on the menu. So you can't ask for uh, anything special at this time because they've got to have all this very tightly controlled. Meats, butter, ice cream, and some other items must be limited to one portion and no double orders. One of the biggest things that comes up in the New Orleans newspapers during the 1940s, one of the things that's rationed very, very tightly that aggravates people. What do you think would aggravate you if it was rationed and you could only get uh, one, little, uh, one little bit of it, especially in the morning? Pardon? Coffee. Coffee. I heard some people say butter. Yes, there's a lot of restaurants that are limiting you to one pat of butter per dish that includes it. But coffee, that is the thing that is most complained of in uh, the newspaper reports on rationing in the city of New Orleans is coffee. And it's particularly difficult for us because there's some sinking of the coffee ships in the Gulf, and that causes a big problem for the coffee roasters here. Uh, that's, a, that's a big deal. Okay, here's another example of something that uh, restaurants are doing right here in the city of New Orleans. This is an advertisement from the restaurant that was in D.H. Holmes. And uh, this is really tight text, so I'll just uh, summarize it for you. What they're saying there essentially is that uh, whereas Holmes used to do these wonderful combo meals like we see in restaurants nowadays where you get an entree, you get a couple of vegetables, you get a piece of bread, you might get a salad, it might even come with a dessert. We love those, right? Yes? Um, D.H. Holmes is essentially saying in this advertisement that they're now going to a strict a la carte menu. Everything will now be a la carte. And the reason for that is so that they can break each piece of the meal up into its constituent pieces and because they have to have ceiling prices for all of those pieces. It's a lot harder for them to predict what they're going to have to charge people if the meal is all conglomerated into one thing. It's a lot easier if they break it up into a chicken breast a serving of green beans, a mashed potato, you know, something like that. And so you get a lot of advertisements like this where they're saying, all right, our menu's completely changing. It's now going to be item by item. This is another example. This is happening, uh, let's see, this is, where is this? this is a restaurant in New York, I believe. Um, and a couple of things, a couple of remnants of, uh, of uh, signs of the war being on here. They note that there's a labor shortage, and so this particular hotel uh, in New York is only able to give room service to people who are disabled or elderly or something like that. But also over here on the side, they note that items that are starred here, and you can see they're things that would be, that would be rationed, things like meat. Uh, they don't have anything milk related done on, uh, done on here. Maybe they do farther on down the menu. Uh, but they note that those items, they may or may not be able to make those exactly the same way that they always do. Uh, they can't always uh, uh, guarantee that those items will be available. So you see a lot of little menu uh, modifications like this. Okay? There's also some, some talk, and this comes up in the newspapers a good bit, about changing certain ingredients. Uh, to make the foods that we were eating uh, in the 1940s uh, demand less of the rationed items. I think one of my favorites is there was a meeting of the Tri-State Bakers Convention. Apparently New Orleans was a big headquarters for the Tri-State Bakers Convention. And they were having a meeting here in New Orleans to talk about what to do about the rationing uh, issue. And one person from Chicago who was a food dietitian and was apparently a, you know, an expert in these things, he piped up and said, well, maybe we should just get rid of side icing and only ice the tops of cakes. Because at that time, of course, you know, when, when we eat cake, we like the cake to be iced all the way around. Uh, but this was just, well, you know, one of the things uh, that they were proposing is maybe just get rid of the icing in between layers of cakes or maybe cakes, make, make cakes only a single layer and just ice them on top. Uh, as, as we know probably from looking at cookbooks from the time period and newspaper articles, another thing that people tried to do is maybe use fruit, either a dried fruit or fresh fruit uh, that had been sort of boiled down into syrup or something like that. Uh, but there's, there's all kinds of ways of swapping around in, in ingredients uh, to, uh, to make these less uh, impacted by ration. Now here in New Orleans, some of our favorite food dishes are not quite as affected, not quite as badly affected as they are in other places. And that's partly thanks to the fact that some of our favorite uh, meals here in New Orleans uh, involve items that are not traditionally rationed. 
Uh, now, if you notice over here, these are, these are all advertisements from the, uh, the States item and the Times Picky Union. If you look over here, you'll notice that they say fish are not rationed. Now, that's a little bit of a misnomer. Canned fish was rationed. The reason for that is that canned fish can be transferred to overseas. It can be transferred to our allies. It can be transferred to other parts of the United States where food may be short, proteins might be short, because it has been preserved. However, fresh fish, when you can get it, fresh shrimp, fresh oysters, those items are not rationed. And you see that reflected in advertisements. This, for example, this is a, a market on St. Claude Avenue. Uh, you'll notice over here that, look, let's see where it is. Where is it? Where is it? Okay, tuna fish. See right here we've got uh, breast of chicken, tuna fish, three points. That item is actually rationed. Fish flakes, that is, is, uh, uh, is point. Here they've got uh, packed shrimp that has been packaged and preserved to some extent. That also uh, is, is being rationed. But over here where you've got uh, fresh fish items, those are not being rationed. So a lot of um, restaurants that are cooking, uh, that, that are preparing traditional Louisiana meals that involve seafood, they're able to continue serving these, but they have to use fresh ingredients all the time, and they can't, for none of it, can they, uh, can they cheat and use the canned stuff, which to some extent might be a good thing. Um, there is one little wrinkle in that, though. Uh, and that is that even if the restaurant does not have to pay ration points to use a particular item, that doesn't necessarily mean that that particular item is always going to be available on the market, as I mentioned a little earlier. You can imagine that uh, the fish that's being caught off the coast of Louisiana, and the shrimp and the oysters to a lesser extent, is being sent to canneries pretty quickly because the demand for, for preserved meats and preserved fish is pretty high. So the prices of these items for restaurateurs is still very high because they're having a fight against all the canneries that are producing a massive amount of food for the war effort. Uh, and so, uh, so this doesn't necessarily mean that restaurants are always able to get those items in an unlimited supply. So that's something to keep in mind. All right, uh, there's, and there's one restaurateur who, uh, he was interviewed for the Times-Picayune in 1944 talking about this, and he said, well, I guess I'll just have to go back to red beans and rice again. <laughs> so, hey, that's not a big, I happen to like red beans and rice, and restaurants around here do a good job with it, do they not? And speaking of which, one additional thing that's working in restaurants' favor here in New Orleans is that red beans and rice jambalaya, things like that, you can actually use pretty poor cuts of meat as the scale goes. Because remember, the people who are making these, they're, they're identifying how many ration points you have to pay for all these different kinds of meats, they're not from here. They don't realize that you can actually use some pretty gristly cuts of meat and some pretty, you know, organ meat and, you know, some of the, I mean, even pickled pig's feet and brains and things show up on the rationing chart, but they're very, very low. Uh, on the uh, on the number of ration points required, you know, for things like uh, the pig's feet and stuff like that, it's only like one or two points uh, per pound or something like that. So it's a very, uh, but we can actually use a lot of those in our dishes here because they're used for seasoning more than anything else, right? And so we can actually we can actually make a lot of traditional New Orleans dishes pretty easily with very ration point cheap meats. So that's great. Another thing uh, that restaurants start doing is closing more often. Um, this is a picture of, I wanted to find a picture, I meant to go out and get a picture of this doorstep right here. This is at 1000 Rampart Street. It's called Johnny's. Uh, I think they, they added in another name. Uh, his last name is in there, there at the end. But it's called Johnny's in the 1940s. That's how it's advertised. And they developed a little program called War Wednesdays. And that had traditionally been one of their steak nights when you'd come out, and that was a good night to come out and get steaks at Johnny's on Wednesday night on Rampart Street. Uh, but they announced in the newspaper that they would be, they would be uh, observing War Wednesdays, and they would close at least once a week. Uh, there was also a voluntary program that some restaurants participated in here in the city of New Orleans called Meatless Tuesdays, uh, where they would only serve items uh, that you know, used eggs, or seafood, some of them construed meatless to even mean no seafood, uh, depending on the place you went uh, and what was available at the time. So there were a number of restaurants that tried to find ways to decrease 
the amount of uh, meat and other rationed items that they actually needed by taking the day off. There were even some restaurants that ended up closing for short periods of time because they just couldn't get enough items in uh, to their pantries and into their storehouses to uh, make up enough of the items on their menus. So, here we go. Uh, another little piece uh, that's interesting about the Office of Price Administration and their efforts here is that it kind of went the other way. Not only did the Office of Price Administration have to protect the consumer, but in some cases they also had to protect restaurant, or they also had to, uh, uh, excuse me, I got that backwards. Not only did they have to protect the restaurants and make sure that restaurants had enough, uh, uh, enough material to, to put together their menus, but the OPA also protected consumers uh, from what restaurants uh, might be doing to try and make up some of their shortfalls. This is one of my favorite examples that comes out. Uh, sometimes, you know, bars were, were, you know, they had restrictions as well. They also fell under this category of, of having to post price ceilings and things like that. And uh, the OPA would actually check on nightclubs and bars and restaurants to make sure that they were not diluting drinks or charging more for drinks. Uh, than they were uh, before the, the 1943 program of rationing begins for restaurants. And, uh, the, and periodically they would have, they would get reports and complaints uh, that, you know, somebody got a vodka soda or something like that and it was all soda and no vodka. Uh, if you've ever had that experience, you don't, you don't want to repeat it. It's a, it's a way to turn, turn your customers off to your, to your place. And so the OPA warned these business owners saying you can't do that, that's illegal, uh, you know, you'll, you'll come under fire for that. And in addition to that, city officials who were trying to help restaurants and bars um, comply with these programs as much as possible, they said, look, it's in your best interest to comply with the rationing program and to comply with the price ceiling program. You're making more money than you ever did before because we're coming out of the Depression. Massive numbers of people are coming into New Orleans, uh, not just soldiers, but also people working in war industries. And so there's lots and lots of customers coming to the bar. And furthermore, you know, if you, if you serve them an inferior drink, they're likely not to come back. So you don't want to uh, kill the goose that laid the golden egg. That phrase actually gets used, and it may even be in this exact article. This is just an excerpt. Uh, so it just goes to show you uh, that, uh, that the OPA had a tremendous job to do in making sure that restaurants and bars uh, were, were giving uh, consumers a fair shake. Now, after all of this, there are, of course, a number of consumers that still uh, do a lot of complaining about what was going on in restaurants. The uh, first slide, the title slide here, actually comes from an advertisement that uh, Pabst Blue Ribbon put out. Uh, and they, it was syndicated in a number of newspapers across the United States. And the advertisement, it was really big, so I couldn't put it on a slide here. It wouldn't be legible. Uh, but I will just sort of summarize it real quick. PBR, the, the Pat's Blue Ribbon, they put out an advertisement that said five ways to anger your waiter. Mm -hmm. uh, because as you can imagine, you know, waiters having to deal with all these customers coming in and they have expectations for what they want to eat and what they want to drink, but then they've got all these restrictions because of rationing. They can't serve meals like they've been, uh, like their customers are used to. And so PBR tried to sort of take the edge off of it and try to get people to, to give restaurants a break by saying, look, restaurants have uh, all of these uh, restrictions in place. So ways you can, uh, you can, you can anger your waiter. Do things like, um, you know, complain when you don't get an extra pat of butter and then loudly tell all of your fellow restaurant goers uh, where another restaurant you've been to where you were able to get as much uh, butter as you wanted to. Uh, stay in a restaurant longer than it takes for you to complete your meal. Uh, you know, they, they uh, laid out this beautiful list of things, and this is one of the illustrations from that. So, uh, that's, that's, there's lots of great advertisements like that coming around. So, a lot of restaurants are able to accommodate their customers during the course of all this, but not all of the restaurants do survive. A number of New Orleans restaurants do close during the course of the war, and you can tell this by looking at the city directories. Uh, if you've ever been to the New Orleans Public Library or to the Tulane Library, a number of libraries here uh, carry a complete set of the New Orleans city directories from the 1940s. And one of the best ways to start checking you know, which restaurants survive and which ones succumb to the restrictions of the war is to compare the, one, the, the city directory from 1943 when the restrictions start to 1945, 1946. 
there's still a tremendous number of people here in New Orleans. So it's not the number of customers necessarily that's killing these restaurants off. But the availability of products, the availability of labor, it certainly does affect these restaurants' ability to stay open. So some of them do survive, but then some of them uh, do end up succumbing. And I found an interesting little poem that somebody put, uh, one restaurateur put up in his uh, window at the end of, of his restaurant's lifetime. Uh, and here it is. Uh, Jay E. Whitcomb closed his restaurant uh, as a result of restrictions from rationing, and he said, no coffee, no meats, no help, no eats. <laughs> so, all right, well that is a pretty good summary there of what's going on with restaurants uh, and, and the dining out experience during the course of World War II. Are there any questions from the crowd? Yes, ma'am. I noticed when you had Puglia's um, up there. Sure. That peanut butter was not rationed. Yes, ma'am, that's, that's correct. Peanut butter, at least at this time. Now remember, the, the items that are being rationed during the course of the war fluctuates. And it can even fluctuate for just part of the year. Because remember, it's, the federal government's not only having to think about the amount of food that's being produced, but remember that certain kinds of food are produced at certain times of year. So rationing sometimes, you know, what was, what was being rationed at the moment of this advertisement, uh, what was being rationed now, may not have been rationed at an earlier point in the war, and it may not have been rationed at a later point in the war. Uh, I'm not familiar with whether peanut butter was, was rationed at the time. It is a pretty stable food, so there's a chance that it was. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. When you showed the restaurant where they had that particular date that they looked at, yes, ma'am. What was there a reason for that particular date being picked as what they looked at? It's right before the rationing program began. So the the those those ten defense those ten strategic defense areas where the OPA had the price ceiling program in place. Now the December 1942 period. That's when they judged the number of customers that would determine how many points you were going to get. But this, this price ceiling thing, they, they judged the price ceilings based on that one week in April because it was right before the program began, and so restaurants would not have time to creep their prices up right before that. So it has to do with their implementation plan for that. Yes, sir? Uh, sugar was rationed. What did they use in place of sugar? You get dried fruit. Uh, sometimes they talk about using dried fruit, taking fresh fruit and boiling it down to get the natural sugars out of it and make almost like a molasses-like substance. Um, I mean, you get people who are using more artificial sweeteners at this time. It's just a variety of things. You know, some artificial sweeteners work for some kinds of dishes and some not for others. Some fruits behave better than others, so to speak, when you bake them. Uh, so it really depends on the dish and the application. How about molasses? Was that absolutely? Rationed? Yeah, um, molasses, I believe, is rationed as well, but I'm not absolutely positive of that. That is discussed as an alternative for sugar in times when granulated sugar is when granulated sugar is not available. Remember, you've got two different problems here. You've got the number of ration points. A restaurant has to have enough ration points uh, to to fulfill their needs, but there also has to be enough supply. Granulated sugar is easier to transport from place to place. And so the supply of granulated sugar is a lot less than the supply of molasses. molasses. And also molasses is not the preferred product for a lot of sweetened food items. So that's how molasses gets discussed as an alternative, even beyond the rationing argument. Just the supply is better, uh, just because there's more of it available. It's not preferred. Yes? Is there a black market in the, in the war, and, and how did that affect? Absolutely, there's a black market in place at this time. And that's going back to that whole item of food consumption, food preparation, and food production as an act of patriotism. Black markets get roped into that as well. There's a number of different uh, advertisements and posters and things like that uh, urging Americans not to purchase from the black market uh, and not to, uh, not to hoard. Uh, and, and you know, saying that that is a, an unpatriotic thing and that that actually helps the Axis powers. Uh, it's still a huge problem. Hoarding is a big deal where people would go out, and especially right before rationing began, uh, going out and hoarding massive amounts of stuff. With the restaurants, this happens as well. I don't have any specific cases of it happening in New Orleans, but I do know that the OPA caught a number of restaurants around, uh, not just in New Orleans, but all around Louisiana and Mississippi and other places in the regional OPA district 
um, overcharging or getting supplies beyond what they were rationed to get. Uh, now, where they got those is not necessarily mentioned in the newspaper articles, uh, but it was possible for, um, for restaurants to purchase things on the black market. It does happen. Yes. Yes, ma'am. So did the OPA regulate wholesale prices as well? That's one question. And the other question I have is, what government agency put out these posters like can all you can and mm -hmm. food is a weapon? Was that a temporary agency you, or, or who was it? You've got an Office of War Information that puts out a lot of these, uh -huh. but then you've also got a number of other administrations that commission their own uh, their own things. The the um, and then of course these the Office of Price Administration they do publish a number of posters on their own. Uh, but then you've also got the federal government's General Office of War Information that's doing posters. They there's a bunch of them. Um, and then let's see what was you, you had a second question. Did the question. OPA uh, regulate wholesale prices? Yes, and they did it two ways. So there's there's a price that wholesalers could charge for a particular item, just like grocers had that at that price as well. And those would get advertised in the newspapers. Uh, those prices would get advertised, and then there's a uh, there's a there's a group whose name I forget that would pay for those advertisements in the newspaper. I can't remember that right offhand. Uh, but then there's that. But then also wholesalers could not sell anything. Uh, to a restaurateur without the restaurateur giving the appropriate amount of ration points. So that's the other choke point. So you got two different choke points. The price level as well as the restaurant has to be paying the appropriate amount of ration points. And again, that's based on the number of customers that they were serving. Uh, uh, and, so, and that was based on the number that they were serving in December of 1942. Yes, sir? What happened if they were caught overcharging? Um, they can be closed down. Uh, they can be fined. Uh, there's there's a couple of different couple of different uh, punishments that can be done. For the most part, it was sort of a slap on the hand and, and you know do better and you need to be brought into line or else you're going to be more tightly regulated and get a lot more visits. It's almost like how the health department does now. Just because you have a couple of health violations doesn't mean you get shut down necessarily, but you might start getting the health the health uh, department representative coming around more often to keep an eye on you because you've had some specific uh, some suspicious black marks in the past. Other questions? Yes, sir. How soon after the war did rationing stop? Immediately? Uh, it depends. Uh, some items were stopped immediately. Sugar actually continues being rationed even after the war. I think it's 1946 or 47 when they finally stopped rationing sugar. Mm -hmm. um, but there's it, it's staggered depending on the item. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. The whole front. You are asked to save your cooking oil and stuff and to recycle yes. that. Did restaurants do that? Or did they yes, do absolutely they did. Absolutely. Restaurants are saving uh, cooking oils and waste cooking fats. And the reason for that is that you get glycerin uh, from, the, uh, from the waste fats and the glycerin can then be turned into nitroglycerin, which is one of the key components in TNT and other explosives. So, yeah. Gunpowder. Yeah. There's, there's actually a wonderful uh, there's a wonderful poster, I'll have to, I'll have to we'll see if I can get it for you, where there's a woman pouring waste fats out of a, out of a frying pan and it becomes a, a bomb or something like that. It's really good. Yes, sir. What about hospitals? Hospitals? Absolutely. And they're, they're being required. Oh, or were they rationed as well? Correct. Yes, they were. And so were boarding houses, boarding houses and, and even uh, school cafeterias. Yes, absolutely. And for them, supply shortage was one of the biggest things. They, of course, got a, you know, a pretty, pretty sizable, um, you know, they had priority in, in the rationing program. And, of course, they were getting what they needed. But, you know, they had to adjust their menus to, to fit what they could get through the rationing system. But shortages are the bigger thing for them. Just being able to get the stuff that they needed to produce nutritious meals. So there were <coughs> collection points for the, for the fats and people would bring them there? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Yes, you could turn them into your grocer. Um, schools, we actually have on, uh, we have a, I don't know if you've seen it, we have a website where we've digitized a series of yearbooks, uh, high school yearbooks from World War II. www.yearbooks.org mm -hmm. is the website. And we have, uh, from Bolton, Louisiana, I think it is, uh, we have a yearbook where the school actually had a grease club. 
and they would go around, the members would go around and go to their, you know, the, there was a member for every classroom or something like this, and they would encourage the students to go around to all the, the people in their neighborhood and collect the grease, turn it in at the school, at this, they even had a little grease house, you know, where there, there were the kids coming up to the window to turn in their grease cans and dump them out. You know, that place had this thing. Uh, but, but absolutely, I mean, it's, it's a, it was a tremendous community-wide collection. Any other questions? Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. For your uh, thank you, Dr. Goodman. We've got some uh, schedules on the back that brings us through the end of the year. We're going to start booking 2018 lectures in October. So if you have a lecture in mind, uh, let us know. And um, thank you all for coming. Awesome.